just while we're doing this, 21 of you have responded, um, you will get an announcement later today, probably. Um, I was hoping to get the room number confirmed, but it seems to be taking longer. Next Wednesday at 11 o'clock, there's a briefing session on an alternative option for the flight test course requirement for you guys. So it's going to show up on your timetable. It is totally optional. And if no attendance is monitored, don't feel obligated to attend. So normally what you do is sometime in year two, we do a flight test course. Um, and it's an accreditation, I like to say requirement, in the sense that it's part of our program. It meets a goal of REAS um, in terms of your understanding of, of moving from kind of the paper-based world to the real world, how you collect data and all of that. It's linked to both aircraft performance and design next year and then flight dynamics in year three. As an alternative to that, we offer you, um, and we did it every year except for last summer for amazing reasons why, the opportunity to go spend two weeks in northern Michigan doing both man flight and UAV flight. So you spend one week um, and one week doing manned aircraft flight and testing. Um, you get about six hours in a Cessna 172, three of which you're in the back seat and three of which you are in the front seat where you have the opportunity either to instruct the pilot to fly the maneuvers that you need to fly to collect the data or you can try to do it yourself. Um, and then in the back seat, you're recording stuff and you're sharing, you download the data, you process and the like. Um, and that's week one or week two. I, they, they switch which order depending on what's going on and the weather and stuff like that. Um, and it's got some buffer in it. Um, and then the second week is a week where you're out at their UAV airport and they have their own dedicated UAV airfield. Um, building UAVs, flying them, testing them, flying larger stuff um, and the like, downloading and looking at the data. And in the past, at least occasionally, they've also done rocket launches where you look at the telemetry from them. So you do flight tests across all of that. It is at your own expense. The fees, um, and I'll put up the flyer and stuff for it when I send out the announcement. The fees cover your course and your lodging. Um, flights, food are uh, extra. You also have the opportunity, and we'll talk about this next week with the, the person from Northern, Northwest Michigan, to do additional flying if you want at additional prices. I tend to go out when I'm there and accompany the students and do aerobatic flying because, of course, why should you fly right side up when you can fly upside down? And um, a few years ago, went up with a, he's a retired U.S. Air Force pilot, flew F-15s, among other things, and we did minus 2.6 Gs, which really makes your head hurt. Um, if you've ever felt like your eyes are going to pop out of your head, it's like that for the rest of the day. Um, and he had never flown minus 2.6 Gs. Um, we actually stalled the aircraft at minus 2 Gs the first two times we tried to do it. We just didn't have enough airspeed to do it. Um, and finally got it right. Um, it hurts. Um, you know, and then positive six and stuff like that. And it's kind of fun. You can also do float plane flying and or just, just more just general single engine stuff. So that will be next Wednesday at 11. Um, I still didn't have a room as of yesterday. I'll send out the announcement today to you guys in the second years. It is totally optional. Um, hopefully the podcast system will work. We'll record it so you guys can, if you miss it, can't attend, are still interested. You. Also, if you don't want to do it this year, have the opportunity to do it next year, or you can just do what we offer at included in your fees and not worry about it, okay? Um, but that's there, so just to tell you, I will be sending out an announcement later today. So, um, let's look at the results. Doo -doo. On an aerospace craft, the fuel system is always considered part of the propulsion system. So this is interesting. It's pretty close. Come on, someone else vote no. Ah, it swaps. No. Um, now, this is one of those things you're going to take. You're going to see these types of questions on the quizzes on the final exam. Um, when you see something always, what are you looking for? You're looking for a case where it isn't, where we have a fuel system that's not part of the propulsion system. When you see the case of never, you're always looking for that one exception that is. Now, we have a lot of aircraft that don't have a propulsion system or aerospace craft. Um, some satellites may have, you know, 
uh, rockets for orientation, but they're not propelling themselves around. So technically they don't, they'll have a fuel system, but that's a bit of a gray area. What about a hot air balloon? Does it have a propulsion system? Again, a gray area. But if you say no, it definitely has a fuel system to generate that flame to cause hot air. So there's a case where it wouldn't. Um, also, what about solid rockets? Solid rockets, the fuel sits in the combustion chamber. So they're the same thing. They're one and the same. So definitely there's a case where they are, but maybe not a case where they're always. In commercial transports, large aircraft like that, we consider them separate systems. So it's not always. Um, and, you yeah, that's just what it is. So sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, um, but they're not always. Same thing if I ask you, is it never considered? The answer is also no. Sometimes you just need to know, is there a case on each end? But it's just one of those weird types of questions that's good to answer and, and see. Let's go to that. OK. Where are the flaps on this swing? 80% of you put trailing edge, 15% of you put leading edge, and 4% of you put root, and 4% of you put tip. So let's look briefly at this aircraft again. Anybody remember, know what, type, what, the, what aircraft this is? Yeah. 177. Okay, any particular model? Yeah, it is a dash eight, but don't need to know that. That's just one of those random things. So here is our wing. This is our leading edge. This is our trailing edge. Same thing with our horizontal stabilizer or tail. Leading edge is just called that because it's the leading part of that surface that sees the airflow, and the trailing edge is the last part of that surface to see the airflow. So on the trailing edge, we very clearly have flaps. We have flaps here, 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 and here. When we use the word flaps, we typically mean for lift augmentation. But what's the other use of flaps on a wing? For? Yeah. As brakes? Those are spoilers, yeah. But there's other one, big one. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the spoilers and flaps. But how about these? The ones, what happens if you deflect those asymmetrically? What do you get? Roll. What do we call the part that get, creates roll? Ailerons. So ailerons are technically flaps, but in this case, we're talking about the high lift ones. This one here is an interesting one. So this is our inboard aileron, our outboard aileron. That's a Boeing aircraft. That's the way they do it. Airbus would have a split aileron out here. You might have an inboard, outboard, or in the case of the A380, they actually have three, and they use them differently depending on the airspeed. Um, and the reason why has to do with wing design philosophies. Um, Boeing aircraft have a problem. If you use the outboard aileron at speed, you get what's called aileron reversal. So the pilot decides to command the aircraft to roll right. What do you think it does? It rolls left. Do you think that's a good thing normally? No. So we don't want that to happen. So what Boeing does is at air airspeed, they lock out these ailerons. They stop using them and just use the inboard one where the wing doesn't twist. And that's just do the way the wing twists. Um, the first Boeing thin-winged aircraft, a bomber called the B-47, had such a problem with aileron reversal, the pilots actually used the rudder at altitude and speed to roll the aircraft. Um, the problem with using the rudder is if you put too much input into it at speed, the tail tends to come off. So they had a placard that said, uh, warning, overuse of rudder at, at speed will cause tail separation. Um, and they actually did have B-47s and then later B-52s where the tails broke off. Um, B-52 got rid of ailerons altogether and just used spoilers for roll control and the original models brought it back. So we talk about these when we talk about flaps. These are classic flaps. Um, an interesting thing about the inboard aileron on 787, also on 777, kind of depending on your definition on 767, is they're actually flaperons. We use them both for roll control and for high lift. So that's that great portmanteau, flap and aileron. The other one you hear about is elevons on delta wing aircraft. That's both an elevator and an aileron. You can have rudder vaders. Uh, on V-tailed aircraft that do are both rudder and elevators um, and the like. These leading edge devices are called slats, and we'll talk more about both of these um, in airfoils, wings, and lifting things. They are also 
technically flaps. Slat is a great another portmanteau that is a slot and a flap. Um, SL and T from slot and the A from flap. Um, but it is a combination of leading edge flap and leading edge slot. Yes. Nope. They are just flaps. They are a form of leading edge flap. Kruger flaps do not have slots, so they are not slaps. We'll talk more about those in airflow wings and lifting things. So if you put trailing edge and or leading edge, you are correct in this case. Obviously, the classic flap that we use the term is trailing edge. Root cord and tip cord on this aircraft, and we'll talk about is, oops, decided to go one forward. Root cord is this here, and tip cord's that out there. And they, on this aircraft, do not have any flaps. Believe it or not, there are a couple aircraft designs where the entire wing tip is the aileron. Um, but they're, they're uncommon, to say the least. OK, next question. Why does it keep telling me the answer? Uh, what type of air, aerospace craft do not typically have propulsion systems? Balloons don't typically. Um, Everything else does in some cases, or maybe in all cases. Obviously, almost all launch vehicles, the ones we know, have propulsion systems. There are some launch vehicle concepts that don't. They usually involve a gun that fires a vehicle. Um, we don't tend to use those for lots of reasons, uh, mainly because you couldn't put people on board. Um, but they're also pretty bad. Um, Fixed-wing aircraft. Do all fixed-wing aircraft have propulsion systems? No. The ones you were using don't. Gliders. Do all spacecraft have propulsion systems? No. Some spacecraft have no rockets at all. There are spacecraft that are launched that have no control system. They're not particularly effective. Sputnik didn't actually have a control system on board. It just kind of orbited in a configuration that kept it stable. Um, dirigibles generally do, but not all. There are some blimps that have control surfaces but no propulsion systems. Most rotary wing aircraft do, but again, you could have an auto-rotating one that don't. But our famous balloons typically don't have a propulsion. OK? And then last of these, what transmits the pilot's control inputs from the fixed frame to the rotating frame? Uh, yeah. I like that you're changing your answer. Uh, swash plate is correct. Um, control rods, hub, gearbox, hinges, and the like. So to look at this a bit more, let's go to our, our, our rotor craft. There we go. So this is the top of a rotor mast on a rotor craft. It's stylized, of course. Um, we have control rods that come in from the pilot. These are in the fixed frame. We have rotating control rods above the swash plate that are in the rotating frame. So that's why we know it's not the control rods because they're in both frames. Um, the hub is this top bit up here. Um, and then the hinges are what connect the blades to the hub. Now, you can have mechanical hinges, like a door hinge, like the hinge that opens this door. But you can also have elastometric hinges that are just dealing with flexibility and materials. Um, and you have hinges that rotate, that flap, and that move back and forth. So rotation, flapping, and lead lag, but they are in the rotating frame. This swash plate, which is just literally two plates with bearings in between, is what transfers everything from one frame to the other. If the swash plate moves up or down, that's called collective, and that means the rotor blades all move collectively. They rotate up or they rotate down. We use that to go up and go down in a and a single main rotor in these type of helicopters. If we tilt the swash plate, that causes the blades to move around as they cycle around, the, go through their cycle, and that's called cyclic control. And that's what we use to move forward, to turn, that kind of stuff. Okay? So the swash plate's what causes it. Uh, down below here will be a gearbox with the main bearing in that. Um, gearbox is part of the propulsion system. Main bearing fails on helicopters, it's usually all she wrote because the whole rotor head separates. And when you have a rotor head here and a helicopter main body over there, that's generally bad news. Um, and so helicopters are really a tight thing. You've got really, really high stresses and energy and really, really critical parts. Okay. 
And I think that was all of those polls. Yep. Um, yeah, they have, they'll have nuts, they'll have bolts, they'll have bearings, all of those if they fail, and most helicopters are catastrophic. Oh, no, as in the Jesus, as long as the Jesus yep. Dead. Yep, but, or the main bearing. Um, it's interesting, there is actually a helicopter that doesn't have a problem. When the main bearing fails, it doesn't lose the rotor head because they expect it to be shot off. Okay, how many questions are there on the glider quiz? 18 or 20? Something like that. It's about 40 seconds per question. So have your notes ready and with you. Have you all done the practice quiz? Do the practice quiz. Get used to it. Because the key thing is the people that tend to do poorly on the glider quiz Comparatively, there are some people that obviously do nothing in this unit. They just attempt the quiz. Actually, every once in a while, we have someone who doesn't do anything. As in, they don't take any quizzes, they don't show up for the final exam, and then they wonder why they fail. Sorry, I can't help you there. Um, but there are a lot of students that don't do well on the glider quiz that come midterm and systems activity quiz get in the 80s and 90s, and it's because they're not used to the style of, of question. You, most of you haven't done these style of questions before. You're not used to this high pressure. I mean, and we're talking relatively short period of time. Can't go back. You have to make a decision. Do I know this well enough that even guessing is worthwhile? Because, of course, if there are five answers on a multiple choice question, when you have negative marking, getting something wrong, you should take off one quarter of the points of that question. You need to narrow it down. It is better if you have no clue to skip it. Um, and they don't skip it. And then they realize that. And they do it on the next test, they do much better. So that's where, so do the practice quiz. Now, last, um, yes, you have multiple, multiple, multiple attempts on the practice quiz. And the reason why, one, it allows you to get used to it. And two, for those of you who have done, anybody here done the practice quiz? Yeah. You'll notice that some of the questions are glider related. And some of the questions are related to the lecture topics we've had or have yet to have. And some of the questions are related to the systems activity. So the beauty of it, this, that quiz allows you to practice four different things. One, it allows you to practice the style of quiz. Because, of course, we want to separate you doing well or poorly based on whether you're used to that style. It also allows you to practice the material for each of the quizzes. So you can come back to it. So you can take it now, you can take it again before the midterm, and take it again before the systems. And take it as many times as you want. Again, I can see how many times you've taken it, but why would I ever look at that? That's too much work. All I'm going to look is, hey, they never took it. Ah, that may be why they did poorly. Eh, next time, take the practice quiz. Okay, so you have multiple tests. Can we consult Mr. Google? So, as it says, the quiz is open notes, open book, open internet. Please do not talk to each other during it. Really, I'm not sure I really care. You can consult Mr. Google. Now, Again, you have 20 questions, 15 minutes. How long do you have to consult Mr. Google? And depending on the question, that first thing, if you click the I'm feeling lucky button, it's not going to be related. So if you have to consult Mr. Google, you're probably going to run out of time. Um, like anything else, there should be stuff that you can recall. There should be stuff that you can refer to, and there might be stuff you have to think about a little bit more. So if you have to look at, think about it a little bit more, consult Mr. Google on all of them. Yes, they, everything is time limited. I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't give you an assignment. Even when we're doing design next year, I don't give you a, an assignment at the start of the semester and say, turn it in sometime between now and when I die. Sorry. Yeah, that might be nice, but 
no, you have to do it by the end of the semester. So everything is time limited. It's just how do we do our time limits? Um, uh, in this case, it is very time limited. You can consult Mr. Google. How do we access the quiz? I, I, I'm going to have to put things together. So for some of you, the easiest way to access the quiz, and it will work, is to go to the bottom of the Glider Activity Learning Module and click on the link there. And that may work for a third half of you. That tends to be what it was last year. The rest of you will get an error. I have no idea why some people it works and some people get an error. It, last year it worked for me, but it didn't work for some of the GTAs. If you get an error, or if you just say, screw it, I don't want to try getting an error, look on the left-hand side of your Blackboard page. In that left-hand list of things, there'll be a, thing, a link called Assessment and Feedback. Go there, you'll see the practice quiz, you'll see a folder for assignment one or whatever it's called, glider thing. Click on that and the quiz will be visible there, okay? When it comes to the systems activity quiz, you'll need to do a little bit more. Um, you need to make sure you've read some stuff and clicked on some boxes and stuff like that, okay? That's how you access the quiz. Uh, what, when is the glider quiz due like time? Quiz is up there and available. It should be visible. Someone has taken it, by the way. At least one person. I'm not able to do the glider quiz. Did you look in the via assessment and feedback? If you still can't see it, send me an email. We'll, we'll deal with it. Okay, flight test course. One is the flight test course and the Michigan one. So the Michigan two weeks includes things that you would do in the flight test course here, but it is much bigger, much more. You do a whole lot more. Our flight test course here, um, you will configure a UAV and you'll observe its flight flying and then you'll record some data and analyze it. It's a much more constrained thing. It is literally a couple afternoons, so it's less than a day versus two weeks. The Michigan one costs you money. The local one is included in your fee, okay? It will be done, the local one, ours, is done in your second year. Um, and then there's some sweep up for people that can't make it in the third year, um, okay? Doo -doo. Flight test course, in the second year. Glider quiz, when is it due like time? It's due 1800 on Friday. When is the Michigan trip? It will be next summer after exams are finished. Uh, I don't remember the specific dates. Again, it all depends how many people sign up and are interested. We typically, I say, get about six people a year. Um, if we get more than about 12 people, we would have to put a second one on and there would be a dif different two weeks. It's just due to the availability. Um, but it is on the thing, when I send out the announcement later today about it, especially if I have a room, it will have some information on that next week, um, more details, okay? Ah, and it says the course item is unavailable. Okay, um, those of you who are still getting that, I will uh, send a thing. Um, one of the things you have to do is you have to read, there's something you have to read and acknowledge, um, and I'll point out where it is, okay? Um, and. How much is the Michigan trip? I don't know offhand. It is in the information. I just don't know what it is this year. Uh, what is your favorite plane? And that is not to be answered today. Stay tuned. We will talk about that in week 11. Second, the last lecture of new material includes about my favorite aircraft. Um, and that may be one of the poll questions going into it. Okay. Next poll. the right answer. Don't ask me. It started showing the right answer. Um, so we'll just get started. You're welcome to keep answering. Uh, so what's the brightest object in the sky as you're changing your answers? The sun. Second brightest. The moon. Okay. Exempting man-made objects. What's the third brightest object in the sky? Venus. 
Now, just one of those weird asides. What planet, on average, is closest to Earth? Anybody know? Yeah, it is. The sun is, on average, the closest non-man-made object beyond the moon uh, to Earth. Yeah, Mercury is closest. Venus is the one that gets closest to us, but because it spends a fair amount of its time on the far side of the sun, and then you, if the orbits were perfectly circular, it would be easy. Mercury would always. But it's because of the eccentricities are different that it's not quite. And it's only Mercury by a little bit. Okay, ISS is the third brightest object in the sky. If you get one of those rare, clear nights in Manchester, you can see it, when it if it has a pass overhead. Hubble's a little bit harder to see. Hubble's actually amazingly bright, too. But it's a little bit higher orbit, and it's smaller. Now, the reason ISS is so bright is, first of all, it's big. It's the largest man-made object in space by far. Um, and because it has us on board. Human beings are crap. We don't like very hot, very cold. To keep us alive, you have to generate a lot of heat and stuff like that. And the only way to get rid of heat in space is to radiate it into the deep, dark black. Right? You have to radiate from hot to cold. Also, you need all that power, so you've got solar panels. Both the solar panels and the radiators, for lots of reasons, are very reflective. They catch the light of the sun, and they reflect it. That's why we can see it. On a nice, clear night, it's a little hard here because the orbit's much lower inclination. But if you go south, you can see Hubble. Hubble tends to be below the horizon more often than not. Okay? Um, Starlink is very, very bright, but that's because there's many objects. It's causing lots of consternation among optical scientists because it basically screws up land-based observations, and it's only going to get worse. Um, they figure once Starlink, one web, Amazon web are up, you basically won't be able to do meaningful optical astronomy from Earth. It's going to destroy it. Um, and it doesn't matter. They have priority. They were given priority by the U.S. government over all other users. They've even allowed to step on radio spectrums and stuff like that. So, just what it is. Okay. Space telescope. Now, it's just not as nice if it reveals the answers right away. Um, yeah, so Hubble Space Telescope is a modified spy satellite. Um, well, we think it is, because like anything else, um, the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office does not admit that this satellite exists. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a KH-11. KH is keyhole. Um, uh, it's the follow-on. Keyholes are, are what we think, what we call the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office satellites. Um, we do know the NRO launches stuff. They have to admit that. Um, but officially, they launch, I don't know, lead into space? Um, they have owned up to earlier corona satellites. If you go to um, the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum or the Museum of uh, the United States Museum of the Na National Museum of the U.S. Air Force, they do have some earlier uh, ones that weren't launched on display, but they've never owned up to this. But to this day, if you were to work on Hubble, technically, not just the data, you need a top secret clearance. Every astronaut that serviced Hubble has had a top secret, specially compartmentalized clearance. We do not, you and I, know the specs of the mirrors, but everybody knows that the mirror on Hubble is flawed, right? That there's an aberration in the mirror. It's off by, I think it's two microns out of the design curvature. Basically, without, when they launched it, it was, primary mirror was useless. They had to replace, put some lenses in, glasses for Hubble, to correct it. Now, because this was from that same tradition, NASA and NRO have a tradition of always building two of everything. That's why there are two Voyager spacecraft. There are two Viking landers. Historically, there were 
two of these missions. There's two mirrors, a perfectly good one sitting in a warehouse. Um, but it's also very interesting because this was how the U.S. government procured launch vehicles. So until recently, if you wanted to build a launch vehicle for a U.S. government mission, be it spy satellite or a NASA mission, you had to have and build a second one. You had to build two of everything, and it had to be ready. In the case of NRO missions, it had to be ready to launch within, I believe, two weeks. So if the first one failed, you had to get that satellite up there in two weeks and on station. And because of the beauty of their contracting, if the first one worked, the next launch they bought, you couldn't just say, well, you already bought the second launch vehicle. We'll give you, you just have to buy a third one. No, no, you had to buy two over again. So you, government paid for two of everything, which of course made everything basically twice as expensive. Um, SpaceX convinced the US government they didn't need to do that, that they would have enough of a launch cadence with the Falcon 9 that uh, that wasn't a problem. The problem is, um, they never met that launch cadence for like the first two and a half years after they started getting government contracts. It's only recently that they've gotten the launch cadence where they literally can launch another Falcon 9 every two weeks. Um, but hey, it's changed the game and it's one of the reasons you change that uh, dynamic, it changes the costs of launching quite a bit. Um, so that's as Hubble's a space, uh, Hubble's a spy satellite. Let's talk about the International Space Station for a second. So this is the ISS in one form or another. Um, the service module and the functional cargo block, they are actually modified rocket upper stages. Skylab, which was the US's first space station, wasn't particularly successful, um, was a modified, they literally took the third stage of the Saturn V and turned it into a space station. In the case of the Russian ones, they are upper proton vehicle upper stages. Um, so there is lots and lots of reuse in the space industry. Uh, the, the US modules are based on each other, but they are custom designed, custom built for this purpose. Um, we see in space probes, um, long distance space probes, we see a lot of reuse of bits of the bus from one, one generation to the next, but it's not quite the same. Um, as using rocket bodies. Um, okay. And again, what systems are common to almost all aerospace craft? Uh, think about it this way. We have lots of aerospace craft that don't have communication systems. You can fly in an aircraft today that doesn't have a radio in some parts of the world. There's no means of communicating from the aircraft to the ground. Um, they don't have guidance and navigation systems. Did your glider have a guidance and navigation system? Ah, he just threw it. Um, there are actually spacecraft, satellites that don't have a GNC system. They just kind of sit in orbit and may have a communication system. In the case of Sputnik, it just went not a radio ping. Um, propulsion systems, again, optional. Gliders don't have them. There are satellites that have no propulsion system at all, not even for um, control. And like. But even the simplest party balloon has a structure. You blow up a balloon, there's just envelope structure. And in the case of most aerospace craft, say party balloons, there's a payload. A weather balloon has a payload. A glider that a human rides in has a payload. So those are probably the two most common. Uh, outside of that, outside of things like throwing your chuck glider, um, we want to put something up there for a reason. Take camera up, take an instrument up. But all of the rest are in a sense optional. It just depends on the mission. Doesn't mean they're not useful, right? Adding guidance navigation control system allows us to do more. Maybe we can keep our payload pointed in a certain spot, our camera. Maybe we can get to an area we couldn't get otherwise. Maybe it allows us to fall asleep while we're flying our aircraft. They have uses, but they are not automatically necessary. 
So as we talk about stuff and you think about stuff, there is a reason we added those, but they aren't always required. They enable us to do more. Okay? Let's pause that poll. Back to question and answers. Are you a spy for the U.S. government, Dr. Hollingsworth? Uh, no. Sorry. Uh, of course, if I was, would I tell you? Um, no, I actually, I know I... Uh, I like being able to travel without having to get permission, um, all of that stuff. So I'm not a spy. Um, sorry, hate to disappoint you. I actually don't work on, on stuff that's particularly sensitive on purpose. Um, so, and the like. Uh, what will be involved in this glider quiz? The glider quiz is about your gliders and the behavior that you've observed, okay? So next week, we're gonna be talking, I believe it's next week, we'll talk about our first uh, session on flight mechanics. Um, this is repelling the earth, so flying, atmospheric vehicles. Um, and what we're gonna do when we talk about that is we're gonna refer you back to stuff you observed in the glider. Um, and the reason why we did the glider is so that you have a physical, practical feel for what the equations mean. Because math's equations, most of us, some of you love equations, but most of us, I put an equation on the board, it doesn't mean anything on its own. It needs to be connected to something real. They are models of what we see and why we see it. Uh, how is the grading criteria in this course? Uh, you do well, you do well. You don't, you don't. Um, I'm not quite sure. So like any other unit, it's quite straightforward. You get a certain mark, you get a certain mark. Um, I, it's not arbitrary in the sense that I don't just go, well, I think you're a two one and you've got a first. Don't do that, sorry, it's too much work. Um, basically, you take your quiz, you get a score, it's worth this one 15% of your final mark in this quiz. Again, don't stress about it. I mean, stress about it, but prepare yourself, but don't panic. The difference, if you are a BN student, the difference between a zero and a 100 on the final exam in this unit is less than 1% on your course mark. Significantly less, I think it's 0.4%. Now, I have never seen anyone that's had such a bad day, they would have got, if they had a good day, would have gotten 100, they got a zero on the final. The only people that happens to are the people that are hit by a bus on the way to the exam, right? By the way, if you get hit by a bus on the way to the exam, don't go to the fucking exam. I say this because we had a student a number of years ago who was cycling in, was hit by a bus and knocked off his cycle. He came, he sat the exam with a bleeding head wound and a broken arm. Now he was okay. The invigilator said, you probably should go to hospital, and he did. And he ended up okay, but it didn't make a difference on the broken arm. But if you've got a bleeding head wound, you probably have a head injury. Get that seen to right away. We can deal with that. Yeah, you might have to do the reset in the summer, and oh, God help you if you have to do that. Um, but, you know, it, it can be excused. Um, you know, go to A&E. Don't show up with a broken arm especially if it's your writing arm. Well, in this case, it's typing arm, but you know, you know what I mean, okay? Is the midterm exam online? Oh, yes, it is online. Um, it is a little bit more, uh, and it's just as evil. Um, generally, people do quite well on the midterm. I think the average last year was 75, generally around 70. Some years a little bit lower, some years a little bit higher. Um, it's the final exam that gets you, so don't, you know. Okay. Is Starlink worth it then? Well, that's a question. Who's, to whom is it worth it? Um, It, it, it just depends. Um, for some people, it's definitely worth it. Uh, it gives, allows them to have reasonable internet speeds where they couldn't. Um, is it worth it if you're an optical astronomer? No. 
Remember, what's worth it to someone isn't worth it to someone else. Uh, I, I'm not exactly a fan of the way the regulatory aspects of it worked out. You know, they basically bypassed all of the stuff, um, which is never a good thing. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not worth doing or it is worth doing. It's just generally not good to just kind of go, well, here's our rule. Never mind. We're just going to do this for that one person, but not for anyone else. Um, what percent is the guider quiz for an MN student? Well, it's still 15% of the unit mark, no matter what. How that translates. So if, if it's 0.4% for the final exam, by the way, which is 50% of the unit mark for BN student, remember, an MN student, year one's worth less of their final mark. So it's worth. It's even less consequential. You are not going to screw yourself over by doing a little bit worse on any of the exams in this unit. Now, when it comes to your third year dissertation, don't fuck that one up. You fail. You get a thirty nine in this unit. Eh, you're fine. We'll compensate it. If it's the only unit you, I don't think you will. You screw up and you go on. If you get a twenty five, you have to do a reset. You pass. You're fine. If you fail your project, bye-bye. You can't get an honors degree. You don't get a redo on it. So some things are much more consequential. This is not one of the ones to stress about. Obviously, try and do your best. But if you have a bad day, don't worry about it. Um, if we die doing the exam, do we pass? Well, it depends when you die. No, I, yeah, they're not that bad. Um, if you die doing the exam, you're in this whole different boat. You don't care about it anymore. Um, that being said, we did award a posthumous degree. It was a very unfortunate incident. So a student died in the middle of the year, third year student, and was doing very, very well. And we did award a posthumous degree. But believe it or not, you have to be in a very narrow window to get a posthumous degree. At this point. So it was, it was just an awful situation. Um, and the like. Okay. Uh, is the oxidizer on a launch craft a system or is it a form of chemical? Oxidizer is part of the propellant. Just like fuel, oxidizer is the other part of the propellant. On an aircraft, where do we get our oxidizer from? Yeah, the atmosphere. We bring it in in the inlet of the engine for that type of thing. On a rocket, we don't have it. There are different types of oxidizer. The classic best-known one is liquid oxygen, LOX. However, other oxidizers have some great names. Dinitrogen tetroxide, which is used in hypergolic rockets. We'll talk about them. Um, that'll kill you dead quickly. Red fuming nitric acid. Yes, it is literally what it is. It fumes, so there's off gases, really not good to be around. It's red, and it's nitric acid. Nitric acid is very good at dissolving you and me, so we stay away from that. Um, in solid rockets, it's usually ammonium perchlorate, AP. Um, that's the oxidizer. It can be all sorts of things. Uh, a common green oxidizer for um, stored propellants is... Um, Hydrogen peroxide, OH. Um, green in the sense that while it is corrosive and may kill you directly, it doesn't poison the environment. Um, it's part of a program. I don't think it ever got funded to create green, environmentally friendly ICBMs. Yeah, that's one of those weird ones. Um, but once you understand what the mission of a strategic weapons system is, you realize why you can use that word environmentally friendly and not be totally obtuse. A strategic weapon system's primary, it's considered successful if it is built, it is operated, and it is retired and never used in anger. Believe it or not, using a Trident missile in anger is considered a failure of that weapon system. It hasn't done what it's supposed to do. That's different from a tactical weapon, which if it doesn't kill someone, it has or blow up some system or whatever, it hasn't worked. So the fact is, we actually expect when we build a Minuteman missile or a Trident or the equivalents in that, that they will sit in their silo or in their submarine, they will be maintained, they hopefully won't kill the people maintaining them, and they hopefully won't poison the farmer's fields around it, and then they will be retired. And that's what we want. 
In a fixed wing aircraft, what acts as a swash plate? You don't need one. You don't have a rotating frame where you're doing that stuff. Except for when we talk about propellers, variable pitch propellers. They literally have a collective capability. But and that, they don't have it for a control system. Okay. Um, I'm going to reopen the uh, teaching poll for next week. Um, and we'll go from there. And that's it for today. Hopefully, I'll get the stuff up and online and available to you later today and on the Blackboard thing. If you're having any issues with your glider quiz, send me an email. I will send an announcement with a little bit more details for those in a little while.